All right, we're going to start looking at cells. That's what this chapter is going to predominantly be about and how cells accomplish various tasks, including moving things across and through cell membranes. But we're going to start off first by just looking at different kinds of cell diversity within the human body. Turns out that the human body has anywhere from 50 to 100 trillion cells. And out of those 50 and 100 trillion cells, there are various different kinds of cells based on function. A cell's form is definitely going to be dictated by its function, and its function is certainly going to be dictated by its form. And it's usually that way. It's the form of the cell dictates its function. So in this picture, you can see that there's quite a few different cell types listed here. We're going to run through some of these. Each of these has a speciality. Each of them has a specialty, and thereby having a specialty, it has organelles that help it accomplish that goal. The first group of cells here, there's two of them. These are called fibroblasts. And these cells function in connective tissues and they make these long fibers. These are collagen fibers. And for these cells to make these collagen fibers, they need to have a couple of organelles in great quantity. They'll need some rough ER to make the proteins and they'll need a Golgi apparatus to process and modify those proteins so that they can be functional. Once they're uh, processed, they'll be exported to the exterior of the cell and self-assemble into these long fibers. Of course, these cells have a nucleus as well, and that's what that uh, line there is pointing to. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see that a little more clearly. The cell right next to it is another highly specialized cell. This cell is an erythrocyte. The erythrocyte is a fancy way of saying red blood cell, and you can see that in the red blood cell there are no organelles. That would seem to be a detriment, not having any organelles. How could it accomplish anything? Well, these cells, when they are mature, basically have one job, and that is to transport oxygen. They do aid in a little CO2 transport as well, but oxygen is what their main job is. So they're loaded with a hemoglobin, a complex glob globular protein that helps them transport oxygen. Cell next to it is called an adipocyte. That's a fancy way of saying adipo is a fat and then cyte is cell. And so this cell has a nucleus, but it also has a large vacuole that contains lipids, or in this case, fat. So it's energy storage, and that's what it specializes in. It's a good time to point out that these cells are not drawn to scale. So an adipocyte is a much larger cell than an erythrocyte, but uh, just for clarity, the artist kind of drew them all similar, similar size so you could see some details. The cell next to that is a specialized white blood cell. This is known as a macrophage. Macro means large and phage means eater. This cell is part of your immune system and so it's involved in defense. It has these little extensions here that you can see sticking out and that allows it to engulf and eat things that aren't supposed to be there like bacteria or damaged cells. These are called pseudopodia and they engulf the item like a bacterium and once it's inside a vacuole on the inside we need to attach little organelles that can help digest that. These little bags here would be called lysosomes. So we've done three here, actually four, and as you're looking at these four, hopefully you'll see that they are totally different. They have different kinds of organelles. They have different shapes. They have different sizes, even though it's hard to tell from this picture. And that is indicative of that they all have different jobs. So their form is going to dictate their function. Next layer down, we've got uh, cells that line and cover things. This would be an epithelium. We're going to focus on this a lot in chapter 4, so I won't spend too much time on it here. But the epithelium that we're looking at here is something called simple cuboidal epithelium, and it lines passageways, especially in the kidney. It does have a nucleus. I'm not going to write that word out. And there are little fibers here called intermediate fibers that help stabilize and hold the nucleus towards the center of the cell. So those fibers, those intermediate fibers, are part of the cytoskeleton. This cell might be very familiar to you, and it Obviously, this one is not to scale because this is a very large cell. This is a neuron. Neurons have a nucleus. They also have extensions here called axons. You probably remember that from various classes. And they have multiple extensions on this end called dendrites. One of the things that uh, axons are known for is sending nerve impulses. And at the end of the nerve impulse sending down here at the axon terminal, small chemicals are released called neurotransmitters, which means we need to have some specialized organelles to help us accomplish that. And rough 
ER would be one of those, helping make proteins. On the bottom row down here, we have muscle tissue. I said tissue, that one right there is probably more like a tissue. There's multiple cells here. This is a single skeletal muscle cell over here. So we have two types of uh, muscle here. We have skeletal muscle and we have smooth. Both of these do a basically the same thing. They have special cytoskeletal elements called microfilaments. Microfilaments are part of the cytoskeleton and they help these cells contract. Now this uh, leader line here is pointing to the various nuclei. Smooth muscle has a single nucleus in the center and this is a single skeletal cell but you can see it has multiple nuclei all the way around so we would say that it is multi multinucleated. Last cell here that's very specialized is a sperm cell. A sperm cell does have a nucleus, although this nucleus has one set of chromosomes versus the normal two sets, so we say it's haploid. And it has a whip-like tail on the end here called a flagellum for swimming. So the whole point of this picture is just to show you that there is a great deal of diversity, and this is not the entire diversity of, of human cells. This is just a small sampling. <clears throat> and these cells are all different different sizes, different shapes, but that is because they have different jobs. Now as we focus on the next page here, now we're going to zoom in on the cell membrane. I'm going to start over here though by pointing out that cells, and I'm just going to draw a cell membrane around here with the nucleus, are basically three parts. They have the nucleus, part one, they have the cytoplasm, part two, and they have the plasma membrane, part three. So those are the three parts to a cell, kind of the three main categories, the three main sections. We're going to focus on the cell membrane first, then we're going to look at some organelles found in the cytosol, cytoplasm along with the nucleus. So let me get rid of that. This plasma membrane is pretty diverse. This is a different picture than the one that's in your book. I just think it's a little clearer, it's a little easier to see. And basically what I want you to notice is that there's a ton of gray molecules here. These gray molecules, let me circle one over here on the side, this is a phospholipid. So majority of the plasma membrane is made up of phospholipids. So really when you look at the edge here, let's look down at the end here, this is a phospholipid bilayer. There's actually two layers of these things. And these lipids are organized because of how they actually behave with water. So this would be the cytosol in here, this yellow stuff, cytosol or cytoplasm, and out here would be interstitial fluid. So this would be outside the cell here, and this is inside the cell. So we have in and out. And you can see that the phosphate heads, these little round circles here, these phosphate heads, are always pointed towards the watery fluid on the outside or the watery fluid on the inside. And then in the middle here, we have these fatty acid tails. So here's a few tails right here. These are fatty acid tails. And these are oriented away from water. And they do this because they are indeed behaving differently to water. We have the phosphate heads. These phosphate heads are what we'd say or describe as hydrophilic, water-loving. And the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. So this is a single molecule that actually has two behaviors. It has, it has the water loving and the water hating in the same molecule. And a word that your book doesn't use is called amphipathic. If you listen to one of the other lectures, we did talk about this briefly when we were talking about lipids. So it's an amphipathic molecule. It has a part of it that likes water and a part of it that hates water. So it has basically a dual life. And you may have recognized that prefix amphi in the word amphibian, which have dual lives. They have part of their life on land and part of their lives in water. So that's getting a little sloppy on the edge, but I will point out that that is all phospholipid. Everything that's gray in this picture is phospholipid. Now, a molecule that's found in the fatty acid layer, the hydrophobic layer, are these yellow things. It looks like we're going to label those way over here on the edge. That's cholesterol. Its job is to maintain membrane fluidity. This picture is describing a hypothesis about membrane structure called the fluid mosaic model. And the key word in that is fluid. The membrane is very fluid. It flows very similarly to uh, vegetable oil. In fact, that is its consistency. So it's just about like water. It's very, very 
liquid-like, and these little phospholipids are basically like uh, ping pong balls floating around on top of water. They really do move around quite a bit. Well, cholesterol helps maintain that fluidity. If the membrane gets too warm, cholesterol tries to stabilize it and hold it together. If the membrane gets too cold, cholesterol keeps it fluid and moving so that it doesn't freeze solid. There are extremes which can cause it to actually fall apart because it's too warm or freeze up and not function because it's too solid, but cholesterol at least broadens the temperature span. Now everything you see that's purple in here is a protein. So this leader line right here is pointing to some proteins that are crossing the entire membrane. So we call these integral proteins. Proteins. Any protein that's embedded in the membrane is an integral protein, but if they are going across the membrane, we can call them transmembrane proteins. Transmembrane proteins can have a variety of different jobs. We'll look at that in a different picture in a second. But one of the jobs of a transmembrane protein is they can become passageways. And so this is a channel. And this channel would allow things like ions that would have a very difficult time crossing the plasma membrane, helps them get through. So the last thing we need to look at are these green structures up here. And it is, if you are into organic chemistry or biochemistry, it is a trend in this book that whenever you see kind of a green hexagon, that is a glucose molecule. So these are chains of glucose molecules, which means they are carbohydrates. This entire carbohydrate uh, chains, all of the chains found on the outside here, are referred to as the glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx is a sugar layer that actually acts as a cell recognition site, kind of like as a name tag. Now you can see that these carbohydrates right here, these uh, glucose chains, these carbohydrates, they are almost polysaccharides. They're not quite long enough. Most books call them oligosaccharides, but that's not a term our book uses, so we'll not write that down. But these carbohydrates are attached to either proteins, like over here, or lipids, like over here. So if they're attached to a protein, we call them glycoproteins. If they are attached to a lipid, we call them glycolipids. Either way, they're part of the glycocalyx, and either way, they're involved in cell recognition. So that kind of takes care of the plasma membrane. Now, I promised that I wouldn't make these uh, little videos too long, so I think looking at some cell diversity and then looking at the plasma membrane, that's probably a good spot to stop this one. What we'll look at next are the different kinds of organelles in a typical animal cell, and that's what this picture is all about. So I think I'll stop it there, and I'll make another one that kind of addresses these organelles.